she'll call and say, hey, you know, I have a quote or we'll talk about it and she'll say, let's let's tweet it. Sometimes she'll say, let's tweet and then um, we'll take it. We won't because she'll say, no, nah, let's not do it. I do think it's her way of uh, getting out her frustration because uh, she doesn't really have a chance to say much. We do talk about the fact that Jody seems to be able to reach out into the community in various ways and profit from her notoriety. Yeah, and we don't like it, but there's nothing we can do about it. Donovan Baring does the tweeting for her as they're on the phone. They follow people, coincidentally, 20 people. Uh, Geraldo Rivera, Gabrielle Giffords, Donald Trump are some of the people that follow. Relatively new, uh, new to social media. Imagine my surprise when Adam Housley there uh, reported that I was one of actually 15 people that Jody Arias follows on Twitter. Uh, which the accused killer of Travis Alexander does through friends, as you saw there in that little piece, as her marathon capital murder trial grinds on. Joining me now, ace criminal defense attorney Mark Garagos. Mark is the author, most recently, of this brand new, sure to be huge, best selling book, Mistrial, uh, which we almost had in the Jody Arias case. I'll get to that in, uh, in a moment. Uh, but with her life on the line, uh, is it a good idea for her to be tweeting taunts, for example, uh, to the prosecutor? Uh, Mark, great to see you, man. Good to see you, You look too. all it's cleaned great. up. I, don't I, know, I know. I got rid of the Geraldo mustache. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, and then you bring me on after the lipstick bounty hunters. So <laughs> yeah, I want to thank yeah, you for that It's as like well. the old daytime show. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, I so, got a chair here. So she, her life's on the line and she's tweeting. What do you think? Well, I'm, look, she obviously has a lot of animosity for this prosecutor, as most criminal defendants do, especially when they get this uh, kind of this in your face um, she's tweeting look she's broken all the rules of any rule book for a criminal defendant um, from the sit on the stand for 17 days or whatever it was to engaging in kind of this fisticuffs uh, so to speak so I, I I my theory has always been on this case that the defense feels like if they get to, the jury gets to know her, that they won't want to kill her, because that's basically what we're, what they're trying to do here. And even in those notes that the jurors were sending in, you notice that they asked or they referred to as not Miss Arias, but Jody, and with some kind of familiarity. I mean, it wasn't like they were buying what she was selling, at least in some of those questions. But there was a familiarity there, and they're hoping that that doesn't breed contempt in this case. Well, I think uh, I, I get it. I, I think that. You're absolutely right. It is impossible for them to sit as close to her as I am to you right now. And then, in my opinion, at least, then send her to the death chamber. I, I don't believe a capital murder conviction is possible here. Right. I know that uh, other commentators disagree with me, but I think that the length of time this marathon trial has gone on and the intimacy of the setting and the questions, I can't imagine that they could kill her. Right. In some ways, I've always been opposed to these jurors asking the questions. I think it takes them out of the role of um, uh, impartial arbiters and puts them into kind of an advocate's position. But she's answering these individual questions almost like she's having her own Twitter followers in the uh, jury box. So there is a connection there, and I agree with you. Everybody else is saying she's going to go down, she's going to get the death penalty. Uh, you know, you and I can be the lone voices in the wilderness saying we don't think that's going to happen. I absolutely do not. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was a manslaughter rather than a murder two conviction, it, also. It could. It, it could. could. And I, mean, I tell you what, let me, let me, between let me, it. Let me, you're right. And let me be even more daring. I think that up until the stumbling of the, uh, uh, the domestic violence expert, the defense expert, who was was caught in a, in a minor lie, but it was enough that they could really trumpet it. Uh, I thought that there was even a slim shot of an acquittal here based on the an abused woman defense. Now, I don't think that that is, uh, is right, uh, quite possible, but I really do think that it will be... Uh, I, I think... Well, here, let me ask you, rather than interview myself here. <laughs> I think that Casey Anthony was overcharged in Florida. I think that when the state of Florida sought to take her life, it raised the whole issue. The, uh, it elevated the importance of the trial, and it really made them pay very, very precise attention to what was going on, and I think it worked against the prosecution. And Casey. you and I on your show both predicted that we thought that she would be acquitted. In, again, case. lone voices, lone in, the voices in the wilderness. Lone voices uh, in the wilderness. In this situation, I think the same. I think that I don't know if you start in, imposing the death penalty on every run of the mill domestic violence homicide, uh, the death chambers of America would be 10 times more stuffed than they I are. I can't tell you the number of judges who say to me, um, you know, they'll see uh, you do a show or a comment uh, on something and then say, I don't understand why these cases in these other jurisdictions get charged as death penalty because we have this kind of stuff going through our courtrooms and it's routinely pled 
or at least filed as a first degree, and then pled down to a manslaughter or a second degree, most, most of the times a second degree murder. And so when you do this kind of overcharging of the death penalty, I think that what that does in this case is exactly what you said. I think it forces a jury to say, we're not going to put her to death. In this. Now, I, I, I don't want to be inconsistent or appear inconsistent. Now, your client, Scott Peterson, the death penalty didn't surprise me because the victim was pregnant. You know, so right. it was a multiple homicide. And when there's uh, multiple there was... homicides and cruelty and torture and those things, that's where the death penalty should be imposed. Well, and you, it's also, all the studies show that for the imposition of the death penalty, a lot of it has to do with who the victim is, um, what the race of the victim is, what the, the and versus the defendant. And a lot of times, if it is disproportionately imposed, it's because you've got a female or a child who, as precisely as you said, who is the victim. If that's the case, that's your, you're more likely to see a death penalty imposed. Give me 45 seconds on the strength of the state's case and, you know, uh, she did it. Well, there's, right, there's no, I don't think anybody is, uh, at this point, other than she, in her first two statements, is saying that she didn't do it. I mean, clearly, she's admitted it. She has to in terms of the evidence and everything else. What they're trying to say, and I don't think that this guy is going to be arguing for an acquittal at the end, but I think very likely he could get somebody to hang this case and hang it not necessarily between not guilty and uh, guilt, but not guilty on a first degree, maybe guilty of a lesser, and they can't decide. And they can't that decide. Happen. I've had that happen a lot of times in murder cases where it's between a second and a manslaughter or a manslaughter and an involved. Right. They hang on the, on what they, they, uh, they hang on the lesser. You, you could find that. I got to go. Mark Garagos, the book with Pat Harris, good buddy also.